Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Give praise to Ahaya. Ashre Ahaya. This is my brother's apple. <laughs> 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 Ahaya. It's good to be with man. you guys on Shabbat Day. Brotherly love. Brotherly love, man. <laughs> my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all. you all are enjoying your Sabbath today as we are enjoying all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. We praise yeah. Ahaya. We praise Him. We praise Yachi. Unity in the Spirit is a wonderful thing. We're going to be looking at the Exodus story. Just to read the story and see some of the things that happen. And it's going to be interesting because there are some things you might not have heard about or known about. Because right. we're going to be looking in some of the other records of the Hebrews, not just the Bible itself. So let's go ahead and start. We're going to pick up from when they started to actually afflict the children of Israel, which is after all the patriarchs died. Because they went into Egypt when Jacob went into Egypt with Joseph, when Joseph was already there. But they did not start to afflict us until after all of our forefathers died. We're going to start in the book of Jasher, chapter 63, verse 1 to 8. Book of Joshua, chapter 63, verse 1. And in the 93rd year did Lawaye, the son of Jacob, in Egypt. And Lawaye was 137 years old when he died. And they put him into a coffin, and he was given into the hands of his children. And it came to pass after the death of Lawaye, when all Egypt saw that the sons of Jacob, the brethren of Yasaphor, were dead, all the Egyptians began to afflict the children of Jacob. And to embitter their lives from that day unto the day of their going forth from Egypt. And they took from their hands all the vineyards and fields which Yasapho had given unto them, and all the elegant houses in which the people of Israel lived, and all the fat of Egypt. The Egyptians took all from the sons of Jacob in those days. So there was, we were living in the land, but we no longer possessed anything, right? Uh, continue. And the hands of all Egypt became more grievous in those days against the children of Israel. And the Egyptians injured the Israelites until the children of Israel were wearied of their lives on account of the Egyptians. And it came to pass in those days, in the hundred and second year of Israel's going down to Egypt, that Pharaoh king of Egypt died, and Malo, his son, reigned in his stead. And all the mighty men of Egypt and all that generation which knew Yasapho and his brethren died in those days. And another generation rose up in their stead, which had not known the sons of Jacob, and all the good which they had done to them, and all their might in Egypt. Therefore, all Egypt began from that day forth to embitter the lives of the sons of Jacob and to afflict them with all manner of hard labor, because they had not known their ancestors who had delivered them in the days of the famine. Uh -huh. And this was also from Ahiah for the children of Israel to benefit them in their latter days. So the affliction was for our benefit, right? In order that all the children of Israel might know Ahiah their Elohim, and in order to know the signs and mighty wonders which Ahiah would do in Egypt on account of his people, Israel. So we were afflicted so that when Ahiah would do his mighty deliverance, we would know he is Ahiah. And this also was a testimony for us in these days, and is going to also attest to the rest of the world that he is Ahiah, Alahiah, when he comes and does it again here in the end. In order that the children of Israel might fear Ahiah, Alahiah, of their ancestors, and walk in all his ways, they intercede after them all the days. So the purpose of all these afflictions and all the great signs and wonders that came at that time and that shall come to pass in the end is for us to obey his voice. Right. The same thing he asks us to do from the get-go. All right, let's jump to Jasher chapter 65, verse 1 through 4, 6 to 15, and then 22 to 36. Jasher 65, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that all the counselors of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all the elders of Egypt assembled and came before the king and bowed down to the ground and they sat before him. And the counselors and the elders of Egypt spoke unto the king, saying, Behold, the people of the children of Israel is greater and mightier than we, and thou knowest all the evil which they did to us in the road when we returned from battle. And thou hast also seen their strong power, 
for this power is unto them from their fathers. For but a few men stood up against the people numerous as the sand and smote them with the edge of the sword. And of themselves not one has fallen, so that if they had been numerous, they would have utterly destroyed them. That was because the angels were helping us from their love, our highest love for our fathers when we're obedient until we get the angelic assistance. For if the children of Israel should increase in the land, they would become an obstacle to us. And if any war should happen to take place, they with their great strength would join our enemies against us and fight against us, destroy us from the land and go away from it. And that's the same mindset of the people that have us enslaved to this day. Right. They want to destroy us because they feel that if we rise up, we're going to join their enemies and overcome them. Right. Right. So the king answered the elders of Egypt and said unto them, this is the plan advised against Israel from which we will not depart. Behold, in the land of Pithom and Ramses, cities unfortified against battle, it behooves you and us to build them and to fortify them. Now therefore go you also and act cunningly toward them, and proclaim a voice in Egypt and in Goshen at the command of the king, saying, All ye men of Egypt, Goshen, Pathros, and all their inhabitants, the king has commanded us to build Pithom and Ramses and to fortify them for battle. Who amongst you of all Egypt, of the children of Israel, and of all the inhabitants of the cities are willing to build with us, shall each have his wages given to him daily at the king's order. So go you first and do cunningly and gather yourselves and come to Pithom and Ramses to build. So they had to use economic opportunities to beguile us into slavery, which they are still doing to this day. Right. They beguile us with financial gain when the real goal is to enslave us. Right. And while as you are building, cause a proclamation of this kind to be made throughout Egypt every day at the command of the king. And when some of the children of Israel shall come to, to build with you, you shall give them their wages daily for a few days. So everything seems good at first. All right. <laughs> Continue. And after they shall have built, built with you for their daily hire, drag yourselves away from them daily, one by one in secret. And then you shall rise up and become their taskmasters and officers. And you shall lead them afterward to build without wages. And should they refuse, then force them with all your might to build. And if you do this, it will be well with us to strengthen our land against the children of Israel. For on account of the fatigue of the building and the work, the children of Israel will decrease because you will deprive them of their wives day by day. So you see what the purpose was? It right. was to put the men to work so they couldn't produce children. Right. They'd be too tired. Right. The whole goal is destroying the men right. because that's the seed of Israel. The lineages go by the men so you can see what the whole attack was. All right, continue. And all the elders of Egypt heard the counsel of the king and the counsel seemed good in their eyes and in the eyes of the servants of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all Egypt and they did according to the word of the king. Chapter and, verse 22. Okay. And the servant of Pharaoh built with all Israel and were employed in that work with Israel for a month. It's interesting even that part of uh, verse 15 you can see exactly how Psalms 83 came to pass because everybody followed what Egypt did. Mm. Well, how they, everybody was on one accord right. trying to do the you same see, thing. Everybody was on one accord. The Egyptians, the king, the servants, and all the people of Egypt were all on one accord with the plan. Right. So they, they were all with one consent. Right. Those to destroy the children of Israel and they destroy by destroying the men. Right. The women, they, they destroy our women as well. But the goal is to destroy the men because that's how you destroy a seed from the earth. Well, the women are on, a, on an issue because if a woman marries a Gentile man, the seed of Israel is no longer. Right, because the child is a Gentile. Right. So. And at the end of the month, verse 23, and at the end of the month, all the servants of Pharaoh began to withdraw secretly from the people of Israel daily. And Israel went on with the work at that time but they then received their daily hire because some of the men of Egypt were yet carrying on the work with Israel at that time. So they still were getting paid. And they, why were they getting paid? Because the Egyptians were still, still there. Working. Right. right. Therefore, the Egyptians gave Israel their daily hire in those days and ordered that 
that they, the Egyptians, their fellow workmen, might also take the pay for their labor. So you see why the purpose was for paying the Israelites. And it's not changed to this day. Right. They could enslave us and not pay us anything. They, they, well, they actually do do it by getting us into the prison system. Right. When we, for our own iniquities first, it gets us locked up. Then they get the free labor they actually wanted out yeah. of us. <laughs> Even our own iniquity is influenced. So it's kind of set up. Do tell. It is. Right. Cause they, they because they put us they, in an environment where it's... Right. And they also portray it in movies and... And all these different things that we're watching, and it programs us to do it or to right. mimic it. Right. So. Right. Program behavior. Or they, or their built-up society, because they, they, they put the money into everything in the society. Mm-hmm. So they put the, they put the strip clubs in the, in the neighborhood. They put the liquor stores in the neighborhood. Right. Cause we can afford that. Right. They put all that stuff there. That is true. It's all that's government. True. You're getting the government financing and stuff like that. Right. It's a setup. Right. It's a well-orchestrated setup, just as the Egyptians set it up. Right. And at the end of a year, in four months, all the Egyptians had withdrawn from the children of Israel, so that the children of Israel were left alone engaged in the work. So it took a year and four months for them to get that plan completely implemented. So that gives you understanding to know the things that they plan, they don't do it right away. Right. Because these are the same things they do today. It's step by step, piece by piece, until they get us right where they want us. And bam. Right. And after all the Egyptians had withdrawn from the children of Israel, they returned and became oppressors and officers over them. And some of them stood over the children of Israel as taskmasters to receive from them all that they gave them for pay of their labor. And the Egyptians did in this manner to the children of Israel day by day in order to afflict in their work. And all the children of Israel were alone engaged in the labor, and the Egyptians refrained from giving any pay to the children of Israel from that time forward. And when some of the men of Israel refused to work on account of the wages not being given to them, then the evactors and the servants of Pharaoh oppressed them and smote them with heavy blows and made them return by force to labor with their brethren. Thus did all the Egyptians unto the children of Israel all the days. And all the children of Israel were greatly afraid of the Egyptians in this matter. And all the children of Israel returned and worked alone without pay. And the children of Israel built Pithom and Ramses. And all the children of Israel did the work, some making brick and some building. And the children of Israel built and fortified all the land of Egypt and its walls. And the children of Israel were engaged in work for many years until the time came when I had remembered them and brought them out of Egypt. But the children of Lawaii were not employed in the work with their brethren of Israel from the beginning until the day of their going forth from Egypt. For all the children of Lawaii knew that the Egyptians had spoken all these words with deceit to the, to the Israelites. Therefore, the children of Lawaii refrained from approaching to the work with their brethren. So then you see something that all of us might not have known, that the children of Levi did not partake in the physical work servitude in the captivity of Egypt. And the Egyptians did not direct their attention to make the children of Lawaii work afterward, since they had not been with their brethren at the beginning. Therefore, the Egyptians left them alone. And the hands of the men of Egypt were directly with the continued severity against the children of Israel in that work. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel work with rigor. And the Egyptians embittered the lives of the children of Israel with hard work, in mortar and bricks, and also in all manner of work in the field. All right, so we're seeing the purpose was to wear the men out so they can't go home to their wives, right? Right. right. Let's continue. Joshua 65, verse 37 and 38. Joshua 65 and 37. And the children of Israel called Malo, the king of Egypt, Moror, king of Egypt, because in his days the Egyptians had embittered their life with all manner of work. And all the work wherein the Egyptians made the children of Israel labor, they evacuated with rigor in order to afflict the children of Israel. But the more they afflicted them, the more they increased in grief. And the Egyptians were grieved because of the children of Israel. This is a testimony and to know that you can't stop what Ahaya ordained. 
though they tried to destroy us, right. Ahaya said he was going to increase us, so we increased anyway. Right. And the same thing happening today. You can, you, they're trying everything to kill us off, yet we're still here. Right. And it's by Ahaya's great purpose. Uh, jump to Joshua 66, verse 7 to 22. Joshua chapter 66, verse 7. So the Egyptians said unto the children of Israel, Hasten and do your work. And finish your task and strengthen the land, lest the children of Esau, your brethren, should come to fight against us. For on your account will they come against us. And the children of Israel did the work of the men of Egypt day by day. And the Egyptians afflicted the children of Israel in order to lessen them in the land. But as the Egyptians increased the labor upon the children of Israel, so did the children of Israel increase and multiply, and all Egypt was filled with the children of Israel. And in the hundred and twenty-fifth year of Israel going down into Egypt, all the Egyptians saw that their counsel did not succeed against Israel, but that they increased and grew, and the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen were filled with the children of Israel. Okay, so that first plan failed, right? <laughs> Back to the drawing board. <laughs> so all the elders of Egypt and his wise men came before the king and bowed down to him and sat before him. And this gives you understanding what these great conferences are in right. the Americas. These big secret meetings, what are they discussing? Right. <laughs> Good to you. And all the elders of Egypt and the wise men thereof said unto the king, May the king live forever. Thou didst counsel us the counsel against the children of Israel, and we did unto them according to the word of the king. But in proportion to the increase of labor, so do they increase and grow in the land. And behold, the whole country is filled with them. Now therefore, our Adonai and king, the eyes of all Egypt are upon thee to give them advice and thy wisdom, by which they may prevail over Israel to destroy them or to diminish them from the land. And the king answered them, saying, Give you counsel in this matter that we may know what to do unto them. And an officer, one of the king's counselors, whose name was Job, from Mesopotamia in the land of Uz, answered the king, saying, If it please the king, let him hear the counsel of his servant. And the king said unto him, Speak. And Job spoke before the king, the princes, and before all the elders of Egypt, saying, Behold, the counsel of the king, which he advised formerly respecting the labor of the children of Israel, is very good. And you must not remove from them that labor forever. But this is the advice counsel by which you may lessen them, if it seems good to the king to afflict them. Behold, we have feared war for a long time. And we said, when Israel becomes fruitful in the land, they would drive us from the land if a war should take place. Well, text, notice he said, don't ever stop them from laboring. Right. Unless there's no, there's no deal any country in the world is going to give us to actually set us free. Right. Their whole goal is keep us enslaved. They, that's their agreement. Right. If it please the king, let a royal decree go forth, and let it be written in the laws of Egypt, which shall not be revoked, that every male child born to the Israelites his blood shall be spilled, spilled upon the ground. And again, we see the attack has killed the males. Right. Because they know that's how you eradicate a bloodline. Right. The prophecy could have not been fulfilled had there not been a male child of Israel. Right. Yahshua would have not came had it not been a male child of Israel. Even the end times, 144,000 men would not be sealed if there was not a male child of Israel. Right. right? And by your doing this, when all the male children of Israel shall have died, the evil of their wars will cease. Let the king do so and send for all the Hebrew midwives and order them in this matter to execute it. So the thing pleased the king and the princess, and the king did according to the word of Job. And they, they wanted to kill all our men because according to our law, our women don't fight. Right. We don't put, our women do not go to war. Now, let's look at this story also in Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. Exodus chapter 1, verse 18. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? Because the king gave the decree for the women to kill all the male children, right. but they fed, the women fed al and didn't do it, right? right? This is like the abortion plans that they do now, yet right. they kill off many of our children, sadly. Right. 
Planned right. Parenthood. Right. The Margaret Sanger, right. that was her goal. When you look up what her mission was, her mission was to just exterminate all the Negroes. Right. Now, that though they're doing that, the children of Israel are still here by Ahia's mercy. Right. All right, continue. And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not after the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. <laughs> he told them the children get born before we get there. Right. <laughs> continue. Therefore, Elohim dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. All right. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared Elohim, that he made them houses. Now, that was key, that he made them houses. In Exodus, we don't know why he actually said he made them houses. But when right. we go back to Joshua, we get to understand why was it that he said that. Because those women chose to fear Ahaya instead of the threats of the king. Right. So Ahaya blessed them with houses when the king threatened them with something else. Right. Let's read Joshua chapter 66, verse 23 to 26. Joshua 66 and 23. And the king sent for the Hebrew midwife to be called, of which the name of one was Sephra, and the name of the other was Pua. And the midwife came before the king that stood in his presence. And the king said unto them, When do you, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you should kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But if you will not do this thing, then will I burn you up and all your houses with fire. There we see. He threatened to burn the houses with fire. Right. They fed Ahaya, and Ahaya gave them houses. Right. So a comfort to us, you know, we do Ahaya say, don't fear what man says or what man thinks they can do. Now, let's jump to Jasper chapter 67, verse 1 to 4. There was a man in the land of Egypt of the seed of Lawaya whose name was Amram, the son of Kahat, the son of Lawaya, the son of Ichiriala. And this man went and took a wife, namely Jacobed, the daughter of Lawaya, his father's sister. And she was 126 years old, and he came unto her. And the woman conceived and bare a daughter, and she called her name Miriam, because in those days the Egyptians had embittered the lives of the children of Israel. All right. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Erano. And in those days of her conception, Pharaoh began to spill the blood of the male children of Israel. All right. And in those days died Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, king of Chittim, and Janes reigned in his stead. All right, so you see how during this time, Edom was over there reigning in the land of Chittim. Continue. And the time that Zepho reigned over the children of Chittim was 50 years. And he died and was buried in the city of Nabna, in the land of Chittim. And Janes, one of the mighty men of the children of Chittim, reigned after him. And he reigned 50 years. And it was after the death of the king of Chittim that Balaam, the son of Beor, fled from the land of Chittim. And he went and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. All right. So we have Balaam there. All right. Continue. And Pharaoh received him with great honor. For he had heard of his wisdom, and he gave him presents and made him for a counselor and aggrandized him. And Balaam dwelt in Egypt in honor with all the nobles of, of the king. And the nobles exalted him because they all coveted to learn his wisdom. He was into witchcraft. Right. All right, continue. And in the 130th year of Israel going down to Egypt, Pharaoh dreamed that he was sitting upon his kingly throne and lifted up his eyes and saw an old man standing before him. And there were scales in his hands of the old man. There were scales in the hands of the old man with such scales that are used by merchants. And the old man took the scales and hung them before Pharaoh. And the old man took all the elders of Egypt and all his nobles and great men, and he tied them together and put them on one scale. And he took a milk kid and put it into the other scale, and the kid preponderated mm -hmm. over all. And Pharaoh was astonished at this dreadful vision. <laughs> Why the kids should preponderate over all. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And Pharaoh rose up early in the morning and called all his servants and, rel and related to them the dream. And the men were greatly afraid. It's interesting. One kid. You already, you can see the spirit behind Mushi. Because one kid, who was the atonement, the lamb. The, the lamb of Right. Right. 
And the king said to all his wise men, interpret, I pray you. Oh, wow. Good. It was a lamb of the first year. Right. <laughs> the Passover. Come right. and tell. Wow. <laughs> and the king said to all his wise men, interpret, I pray you, the dream which I, which I dream that I may know it. And Balaam, the son of Beor, answered the king and said unto him, this means nothing else but a great evil that will spring up against Egypt in the latter days. For a son would be born to Israelo, who would destroy all Egypt and its inhabitants, and bring forth the Israelites from Egypt with a mighty hand. We see how the focus is on the sons. They want to destroy the sons. Continue. Now, therefore, O king, take counsel upon this matter, that you may destroy the hope of the children of Israel and their expectation before this evil arise against Egypt. And it's interesting that their whole attack was on the sons then, and even now today. The attack is on the whole household with purpose to destroy the children and the parents. Right. They separate the parents. We don't learn righteousness. Hence, our children aren't raised in righteousness. Right. And we're left desolate. It leaves us in a very bad place. With the amount of things they do with the vaccinations and the different things to destroy the household. Right. And the king said unto Balaam, And what shall we do unto Ichiriala? Surely after a certain manner did we at first counsel them and could not prevail over them. Now therefore give you also advice against them, by which we may prevail over them. And Balaam answered the king, saying, Send now and call thy two counselors, and we will see what their advice is upon this matter, and afterward thy servant will speak. And the king sent and called his two counselors, Ruel the Midianite, and Job the Uzite. And they came and sat before the king. And the king said to them, Behold, you have both heard the dream which I have dreamed, and the interpretation thereof. Now, therefore, give counsel and know, and see what is to be done to the children of Israel, whereby we may prevail over them, before their evil shall spring up against us. And Ruel the Midianite answered the king and said, May the king live. May the king live forever. If it seem good to the king, let, his, let him desist from the Hebrews, and leave them, and let him not stretch forth his hand against them. For these are they whom I had chose in the days of old, and took as the lot of his inheritance from amongst all the nations of the earth, and the kings of the earth. This is touching back to when the languages got split at the Tiles of Babel, because the Hebrews are from Noah, Shem, Eber, and Abraham. Right. Retained. Those are his chosen lot. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7 to 9 talks about. And who is there that stretcheth his hand against them with impunity, of whom their Elohim was not avenged? And, there, and they also gives understanding of when you say Hebrews, that's referring to us. Because the Hebrew, the title of Hebrew goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, not the other sons of Abraham. They are not Hebrews, according to Ahayah's ordaining. When you read the book of Jubilees, it's uh, either chapter 15 or chapter 16 where it talks about how the other sons are counted under the Gentiles, but in Isaac shall I see it be called. Right. Surely thou knowest that when Abraham went down to Egypt, Pharaoh, the former king of Egypt, saw Sarah his wife and took her for a wife because Abraham said, She is my sister. For he was afraid, lest the men of Egypt should slay him on account of his wife. And when the king of Egypt had taken Sarah, then Elohim smote him and his household with heavy plagues until he restored unto Abraham his wife Sarah. Then was he healed. And Abimelech the Gerite, the king of the Philistines, Elohim punished on account of Sarah, wife of Abram, and stopping up every womb from man and beast. When the Elohim came to Abimelech in the dream of night and terrified him in order that he might restore to Abraham Sarah whom he had taken. And afterward all the people of Gerar were punished on account of Sarah. And Abram prayed to his Elohim for them and he was entreated of, the, of him and he healed them. And Abimelech feared all this evil that came upon him and his people. And he returned to Abraham his wife Sarah and gave him with her many gifts. He did so also unto Isaac when he had driven him from Gerar and Elohim had done wonderful things to him that all the water courses of Gerar were dried up 
and their productive trees did not bring forth. Mm. So you get a little more backstory of what happened there right. because of what they were doing to Isaac. Continue. Until Abimelech of Gerar and Ahuza, one of his friends, and Pisco, the captain of his host, went to him, and they bent and bowed down before him to the ground. So they had to acknowledge the, why they were getting afflicted. Right. Continue. And they requested of him to supplicate for them, and he prayed to Ahiah for them. And Ahiah was entreated of him, and he healed them. We see the mercy of our fathers, too. How even though they were being entreated evil, they still did not enjoy seeing their enemies perish. Right. Yaakov also, the plain man, was delivered through his integrity from the hand of his brother Esau and the hand of Laban, the Syrian, his mother's brother, who had sought his life. So we see what delivers us? Integrity. Right. Keep doing the fruits of the Spirit, keeping the commandments. Continue. Likewise, from the hand of all the kings of Canaan, who had come together against him and his children to destroy them, and how he delivered them out of their hands, that they turned upon them and smote them. For who had ever stretched forth his hand against them with impunity? Surely Pharaoh, the former, thy father's father, raised Yasapho, the son of Jacob, above all the princes of the land of Egypt, when he saw his wisdom. For through his wisdom he rescued all the inhabitants of the land from the famine. After which he ordered Jacob and his children to come down to Egypt in order that through their virtue the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen might be delivered from the famine. Now therefore, if it seem good in thine eyes, cease from destroying the children of Israel. But if, but if it be not thy will that they shall dwell in Egypt, send them forth from here that they may go to the land of Canaan, the land where their ancestors sojourned. And Ruel is who is going to be Moses' um, father in law. So you can understand who he is and is getting a backstory of where he came from, okay? And where he understood. Right. And how Zephor understood all of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and when Pharaoh heard the words of Jethro, he was very angry with him. And Jethro was Ruel. Right. Thank you. So that he rose with shame from the king's presence. And went to Midian, his land, and took Yosephus' stick with him. And notice, Jethro, he's a Midianite. Those are the children of Abraham. Right. So you can see how, though they are the children of Abraham, they're not Hebrews. Because the Hebrews are the children of Jacob. All right? Um, and the king said to Job the Uzite, What sayest thou, Job? And what is thy advice respecting the Hebrews? So Job said to the king, Behold, all the inhabitants of the land are in thy power. Let the king do as it seemed good in his eyes. And the king said to Balaam, What doest thou say, Balaam? Speak thy word that we may hear it. And Balaam said to the king, Of all that the king has counseled against the Hebrews, will they be delivered? <laughs> <laughs> and the king will not be able to prevail over them with any counsel. For Balaam was testing the spirit to see what they were going to say, mm -hmm. knowing that they can't prevail it. Mm -hmm. For if thou thinkest to lessen them by the flaming fire, thou canst not prevail over them. For surely that Elohim delivered Abraham their father from Ur of the Chaldeans. And if thou thinkest to destroy them with a sword, surely Isaac their father was delivered from it, and a ram was placed in his stead. And if with hard and rigorous labor thou thinkest to lessen them, thou wilt not prevail even in this. For their father Jacob served Laban in all manner of hard work and prospered. Now therefore, O king, hear my words. For this is the counsel which it counseled against them, by which thou wilt prevail over them, and from which thou shouldest not depart. If it please the king, let him order all their children which shall be born from this day forward to be thrown into the water. For by this canst thou wipe away their name, for none of them nor their fathers were tried in this manner. And the king heard the words of Balaam, and the thing pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Balaam. And the king ordered a proclamation to be issued and a law to be made throughout the land of Egypt, saying, 
Every male child born to the Hebrews from this day forward shall be thrown into the water. Let me see again. Focus. Get rid of the boys right. so that the nation can be no more. Continue. And Pharaoh called unto all his servants, saying, Go now and seek throughout the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel are, and see that every son born to the Hebrews shall be cast into the river. But every daughter you shall let live. And they wanted to let the daughters live because they know once if it's only women left, the women are forced to marry them, our nation is finished. Right. And you see how society even focuses on uplifting the women and promoting the women to walk in, in lust and haughtiness and pride to separate from the righteousness of Allah Hayyam, just as they separated the men from the righteousness of Allah Hayyam, from bearing the fruits of the Spirit walking in righteousness and guiding a household that we will not come together and raise families up in righteousness. It's interesting. You can even see the agenda because at first they took all the wealth away from the men, away from Ichariala, the houses, everything, the land, the vineyards. They took everything away from them. And now they're like, okay, let's go ahead and take out the men. And they had already started doing just like they did in this society where our men are brought low, we have nothing, and now the women are looking at the Gentiles who have everything. It's entirely true. First, I want to give a testation of the righteousness of the women at that time, because right. the men did have nothing, right? and the women stayed with them. Yes, they did. The, the daughters of Jacob stayed with their husbands in the midst of such horrible times. Right. They didn't leave their husband and cleave to the Gentiles, once they seen their husbands didn't have anything. Interesting. Yes, so indeed. that it was key to, to see the parallel, the dichotomy of how far gone we as a people are today, as opposed to how even in the midst of tribulation, we held together right. much better in those ancient times. All nations cleave in righteousness together. Let this, what happened to us as a nation, be a testament for you to bring your households together in righteousness, that you be not separated. Because the devil indeed seeks to kill all of us, even though the attack is mainly focused on the Israelites. It's amazing how they're doing the same thing. Right, uh, they did I, it. They, they literally did it. They had to bring us low first and then uplift their people. Right. And then in our lowest state, then they continue to beat us down until we, we're... We, we just completely get eradicated. Right. But it doesn't work. Ahaya has a prophecy to fulfill. Yahweh is the spirit of prophecy. Right. His people are still going to come out of it. All right. Uh, verse 53. And when the children of Echadala heard this thing which Pharaoh had commanded to cast their male children into the river, some of the people separated from their wives and others adhered to them. From... Uh -huh. And from that day forward, when the time of delivery arrived to those women of Israel who had remained with their husbands, they went to the field to bring forth there. Now, this is amazing. Things were so bad that the men separated from their wives. Right. Right? So, if they realize how bad things are, you got to separate right. so that you're doing it for the protection of the family. Right. And what's amazing is the wives did not go commit adultery. Right. They did not go be with other men. During the separation, they stay separated. It shows all we were going through was still on one accord. Continue. And they brought forth in the field and left their children upon the field and returned home. And now this is amazing. To, that shows the faith they had too, to bear your children in a field and leave them there. Because right. we know when a woman bears a child, they are truly uh, connected to their children. That's right. not an easy thing to do. Right. But they had that much faith in Allah Hayyam. We see what Ahaya had in store. And Ahaya, who had sworn to their ancestors to multiply them, sent one of his ministering angels, which are in heaven, to wash each child in water, to anoint mm. and swallow it, and to put into his hand two smooth stones, from one of which it sucked milk, and from the other honey. That's just amazing, Ahaya's right. mercy. Right. In the midst of all that, and it caused the hair to grow to its knee, <laughs> by which it might cover itself, to comfort it and to cleave to it. 
through his compassion for it. So he made the hair grow long to cover them so they'd be warm and gave them rocks to drink milk and honey. Right. This is exhortation of Ahia's word will be fulfilled. It cannot be stopped, right. no matter what it looks like. All right, continue. And when Elohim had compassion over them, he had desired to multiply them upon the face of the land. He ordered his earth to receive them, to be preserved therein, till the time of their growing up. Wow. After which the earth opened its mouth and vomited them forth, and they sprouted forth from the city like the herb of the, of the earth and the grass of the forest, and they returned each to its family and to its father's house, and they remained with them. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. The earth held the children until they were of age, and then the children came out of the earth and went straight to their parents. Right. That lets you know when the Spirit controls all things, the Spirit kept those children knowing who their parents were to go right to them. Right. Ahaya controls everything. He is Allah, and there is no other. Probably sending them dreams of who their parents were. He made sure they knew. Right. He remember in Job, you 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 attested right because Job chapter thirty three talks about how he, he speaketh unto man in a vision of the night. Yeah, right. he speaketh once, he speaketh twice right. to seal his instruction. Right. Those children knew exactly who their parents were. Right. Allah, you can't. No, none can stop what Ahia has ordained. All right, let's continue. And the babes of the children of Israel were upon the earth like the herb of the field through Elohim's grace to them. And when all the Egyptians saw this thing, they went forth each to his field with his yoke of oxen and his plowshare. And they plowed it up as one plows the earth at seed time. And when they plowed, they were unable to hurt the infants of the children of Israel. So the people increased and waxed exceedingly. And Pharaoh ordered his officers daily to go to Goshen to seek for the, for the babes of the children of Israel. And when they had sought for, and when they had sought and found one, they took it from its mother's bosom by force and threw it into the river. But the female child they left with its mother. Thus did the Egyptian do to the Israelites all the days. And we see the attack. All right. Well, now we're at Joshua sixty-eight one to thirty-two. You want me to join you? If you want to, sure. Sure. I'll read Joshua chapter 68, verse 1 to 32. Okay. And it was at that time the spirit of Elohim was upon Miriam, the daughter of Amram, the sister of Aaron. And she went forth and prophesied about the house, saying, Behold, a son will be born unto us from my father and mother this time, and he will save Israel from the hands of Egypt. And when Amram heard the words of his daughter, he went and took his wife back to the house. After he had driven her away at the time when Pharaoh ordered every male child of the house of Jacob to be thrown into the water. So Amram took Jacobed, his wife, three years after he had driven her away, and he came to her and she conceived. And at the end of seven months from her conception, she brought forth a son. And the whole house was filled with great light as of the light of the sun and moon at the time of their shining. And when the woman saw the child that it was good and pleasing to the sight, she hid it for three months in an inner room. In those days the Egyptians conspired to destroy all the Hebrews there. And the Egyptian women went to Goshen, where the children of Israel were. And they carried their young ones upon their shoulders, their babes who could not yet speak. And in those days, when the women of the children of Israel are brought forth, each woman had hidden her son from before the Egyptians that the Egyptians might not know of their bringing forth and might not destroy them from the land. And the Egyptian women came to Goshen, and their children whom could not speak were upon their shoulders. And when an Egyptian woman came into the house of a Hebrew woman, her babe began to cry. And when it cried, the child that was hid in the inner room answered it. So the Egyptian women went and told it at the house of Pharaoh. So you can see the women were in coherence to the whole plan, too. All right. Verse 11. Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh sent his officers to take the children and slay them. Thus did the Egyptians to the Hebrew women all the days. It was at that time, about three months from Jacobet's concealment of her son, that the thing was known in Pharaoh's house. And the woman hastened to take away her son before the officers came, and she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister, Miriam, stood afar off to know what would be done to him and what would become of her words. 
Well, because she had gave the prophecy, so she wants to see it fulfilled. <laughs> and Elihim sent forth at that time a terrible heat in the land of Egypt, which burned up the flesh of man like the sun in his circuit. And it greatly oppressed the Egyptians. And all the Egyptians went down to bathe in the river on account of the consuming heat which burned up their flesh. And Bathia, the daughter of Pharaoh, went also to bathe in the river, owing to the consuming heat, and her maidens walked at the river side, and all the women of Egypt as well. And Bathia lifted up her eyes to the river, and she saw the ark upon the water, and sent her maid to fetch it. And she opened it, and saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and she said, This is one of the Hebrew children. And the women of Egypt, walking on the river side, desired to give him suck, but the he would not suck. For this thing was from Ahaya in order to restore him to his mother's breast. And Miriam, his sister, was at, the, at that time among the Egyptian women at the riverside. And she saw this thing and she said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go fetch a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the young woman went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to Jacobed, Take this child away and suckle it for me, and I will pay thee thy wages, two bits of silver daily. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And at the end of two years, when the child grew up, she brought him to the daughter of Pharaoh, and he was unto her as a son, and she called his name Mushi, for she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And Amram his father called his name Kabar, for he said, It was for him that he associated with his wife, whom he had turned away. And Jacobet, his mother, called his name Jacutiel, because she said, I have hope for him to the Almighty, and Allah restored him unto me. So we see that Jacobet, she did that in faith, mm -hmm. to put him in them bulrushes. She trusted in Allah And Miriam, his sister, called him Jared, for she descended after him to the river to know what his end would be. And Aaron, his brother, called his name Abi Zanuk, saying, My father left my mother and returned to her on his account. And Kehath, the father of Amram, called his name Abigdor, because on his account did Allah repair the breach of the house of Jacob, that they could no longer throw their male children into the water. And the nurses called him Abi Soko saying, In his tabernacle was he hidden for three months on account of the children of Ham. And all Israel called his name Shemaiah, the son of Natanel. For they said, In his days has Elihim heard their cries and rescued them from their oppressors. Yeah. And Moses was in Pharaoh's house and was unto Bathia, Pharaoh's daughter, as a son. And Moses grew up among the king's children. Now we we'll jump into Joshua 70, verse 1 to 33. And in the third year from the birth of Moses, Pharaoh sat at a banquet when Al-Paranith, the queen, was sitting at his right and Bathia at his left. And the lad Moses was lying upon her bosom. And Balaam, the son of Beor, with his two sons and all the princes of the kingdom, were sitting at the table in the king's presence. And the lad stretched forth his hand upon the king's head and took the crown from the king's head and placed it on his own head. And when the king and princes saw the work which the boy had done, the king and the princes were terrified. <laughs> and one man to his neighbor expressed astonishment. And the king said unto the princes, Who were before him at table? What speak you and what say you? O ye princes, in this matter, and what is to be the judgment against the boy on account of this act? And Balaam, the son of Beor, the magician, answered before the king and princes, and he said, Remember now, O my Adonai and king, the dream which thou didst dream many days since, and that which thy servant interpreted unto thee. Now therefore this is a child from the Hebrew children, in whom is the spirit of Allah. And let not my Adonai and king imagine that this youngster did this thing without knowledge. For he is a Hebrew boy, and wisdom and understanding are with him, although he is yet a child. And with wisdom has he done this, and chosen unto himself the kingdom of Egypt. For this is the matter of all Hebrews, to deceive kings and their nobles, to do all these things cunningly, in order to make the kings of the earth and their men tremble. Surely thou knowest that Abraham their father acted thus, who deceived the army of Nimrod, king of Babel, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, 
and that he possessed himself of the land of the children of Heth and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and that he descended into Egypt and said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister, in order to mislead Egypt and her king. His son Isaac also did so when he went to Gerar and dwelt there, and his strength prevailed over the army of Abimelech, king of the Philistines. He also thought of making the kingdom of the Philistines stumble in saying that Rebekah his wife was his sister. Jacob also dealt treacherously with his brother and took from his hand his birthright and his blessing. And he went then to Badan Aram to the house of Laban his mother's brother and cunningly obtained from him his daughter, his cattle and all belonging to him and fled away and returned to the land of Canaan to his father. His son sold their brother Joseph, who went down into Egypt and became a slave and was placed in the prison house for twelve years, until the former Pharaoh dreamed dreams and withdrew him from the prison house and magnified him above all the princes of Egypt on account of his interpreting his dreams to him. And when Elohim caused a famine throughout the land, he sent it for and brought his father and all his brothers and the whole of his father's household and supported them without price or reward and brought the Egyptians for slaves. This is amazing. This is not how it went, but the way he's telling the story. <laughs> we helped the Egyptians as Ruel attested, but he's telling the story from a whole other perspective, speaking from the side of the enemy. Now, therefore, my Adonah king, behold, this child has risen up in their stead in Egypt to do according to their deeds and to trifle with every king, prince, and judge. If it please the king, let us now spill his blood upon the ground, and lest he grow up and take away the government from thy hand. And the hope of Egypt perish after he shall have reigned. And Balaam said to the king, Let us moreover call for all the judges of Egypt and the wise men thereof, and let us know if the judgment of death is due to this boy as thou didst say, and then we will slay him. And Pharaoh sent and called for all the wise men of Egypt, and they came before the king, and an angel of Ahia came amongst them, and he was like one of the wise men of Egypt. And the king said to the wise men, Surely you have heard what this Hebrew boy who is in the house has done, and ha thus has Balaam judged in this matter. Now judge you also and see what is due to the boy for the act he has committed. And the angel who seemed like one of the wise men of Pharaoh answered and said as follows, Before all the wise men of Egypt and before the king and the princes, if it please the king, let the king send for men who shall bring before him an onyx stone and a coal of fire, and place them before the child, and if the child shall stretch forth his hand and take the onyx stone, and then, then shall we know that with wisdom has the youth done all that he has done, and we must slay him. But if he stretch forth his hand upon the coal, then shall we know that it was not with knowledge that he did this thing, and he shall live. And the thing seemed good in the eyes of the king and the princes, so the king did according to the word of the angel of Ahia. And the king ordered the onyx stone and the coal to be brought and placed before Moses. And they, pitched the, and they placed the boy before them, and the lad endeavored to stretch forth his hand to the onyx stone. But the angel of Ahia took his hand and placed it upon the coal. And the coal became extinguished in his hand, and he lifted it up and put it into his mouth, and it burned part of his lip and part of his tongue. And he became heavy in mouth and tongue. And now we understand how Moses was slow of speech. This is the event that caused that. Right. And we also see how angels are working in everything. Right. And when the king and princes saw this, they knew that Moses had not acted with wisdom in taking off the crown of the king's head. So the king and princes refrained from slaying the child. So Moses remained in Pharaoh's house, growing up, and Ahiah was with him. And whilst the boy was in the king's house, he was, ro he was robed in purple, and he grew up amongst the, king, the children of the king. And when Moses grew up in the king's house, Bathia, the daughter of Pharaoh, considered him as a son, and all the household of Pharaoh honored him, and all the men of Egypt were afraid of him. This is Jasher. We're still in Joshua 7, now in verse 34 to 51. And he daily went forth and came into the land of Goshen, where his brethren, the children of Israel, were. And Moses saw them daily in shortness of breath and hard labor. And Moses asked them, saying, Wherefore is this labor meted out unto you day by day? And they told him all that had befallen them and all the injunctions which Pharaoh had put upon them before his birth. 
And they told him all the counsels which Balaam the son of Beor had counseled against him, and what he had also counseled against him in order to slay him when he had taken the king's crown off his head. And when Moses heard these things, his anger was kindled against Balaam, and he sought to kill him. And he was in ambush for him day by day. And Balaam was afraid of Moses, and he and his two sons rose up and went forth from Egypt. And they fled and delivered their souls and betook themselves in the land of Cush to Kekainas, king of Cush. And Moses was in the king's house, going out and coming in. Ahiah gave him favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants and in the eyes of all the people of Egypt, and they loved Moses exceedingly. And the day arrived when Moses went to Goshen to see his brethren, that he saw the children of Israel in their burdens and hard labor, and Moses was grieved on their account. And Moses returned to Egypt and came to the house of Pharaoh and came before the king, and Moses bowed down before the king, and Moses said unto Pharaoh, I pray thee, my Adonah, I have come to seek a small request from thee. Turn not away my face empty. And Pharaoh said unto him, Speak. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Let there be given unto thy servants the children of Israel, who are in Goshen, one day to rest therein from their labor. And the king answered Mushi and said, Behold, I have lifted up thy face in this thing to grant thy request. And Pharaoh ordered a proclamation to be issued throughout Egypt and Goshen, saying, To you, all the children of Israel, thus says the king, For six days shall you shall do your work and labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest, and shall not perform any work. Thus shall you do all the days, as the king and Moses, the son of Bathia, have commanded. That was the wisdom. Moses knew what day they needed to, they needed to rest on. Bringing them back to Allah, I am reconciling them to him. Right, through wisdom. Through the Holy Spirit. Praise Ahaya. And Moses rejoiced at this thing which the king had granted to him, and all the children of Israel did as Moses ordered them. For this thing was from Ahaya to the children of Israel. For Ahaya had begun to remember the children of Israel to save them for the sake of their fathers. So now you see how important the Shabbat day is. What does it say in Ezekiel chapter 20 and 12? It's a sign between us and him, so that Shabbat day is very important. 20 and 12 and also 20 and 20. Yeah, moreover, 20 and 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Shabbat as to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Ahaya that sanctify them. So, praise Ahaya. And it's good comfort for us to know, too, when we do get to keep the Shabbat, that is Ahaya that's doing it. Right. He's beginning to remember us again for our Father's sake. That's right. Um, in verse 50. And Ahiah was with Moses, and his fame went throughout Egypt. And Moses became great in the eyes of all the Egyptians and in the eyes of all the children of Israel, seeking good for his people, Israel, and speaking words of peace regarding them to the king. So we see the difference in how somebody that's in a position of leadership will actually be trying to help the people. The as mediator. A, right. Instead of what they're doing today. Jasher chapter 71, verse 1 to 16. And when Moses was 18 years old, he desired to see his father and mother. And so it shows Moses still understood who his father and mother really was. <laughs> and he went to them in Goshen. And when Moses had came near Goshen, he came to the place where the children of Israel were engaged in work. And he observed their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian smiting one of his Hebrew brethren. And when the man who was beaten saw Moses, he ran to him for help. For the man Moses was greatly respected in the house of Pharaoh, and he said to him, my Adonai, attend to me. This Egyptian came to my house in the night, bound me, and came to my wife in my presence. And now he seeks to take away my life, take my life away. That's the stuff that was happening to us in slavery. Right. And when Moses we heard this... in slavery. This is slavery. Yeah, this is slavery. Just doing it again. You can see where they got it from. And when Moses heard this wicked thing, his anger was kindled against the Egyptian. And he turned this way and the other. And when he saw there was no man there, he smote the Egyptian and hid him in the sand and delivered the Hebrew from the hand of him that smote him. And the Hebrew went to his house and Moses returned to his home and went forth and came back to the king's house. And when the man had returned home, he thought of repudiating his wife. For it was not right in the house of Jacob for any man to come to his wife after she had been defiled. 
And the woman went and told her brothers. And the woman's brothers sought to slay him, and he fled to his house and escaped. And the second day Moses went forth to his brethren and saw, and behold, two men were quarreling. And he said to the wicked one, Why dost thou smite thy neighbor? So we see now we understand what was going on when Moses said, Why are you smiting your brother in the book of Exodus? This is the backstory of what actually happened. And he answered him and said to him, Who has set thee for a prince and judge over us? Dost thou think to slay me as thou didst slay the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid, and he said, Surely this thing is known. And Pharaoh heard of this affair, and he ordered Moses to be slain. So Elohim sent his angel, and he appeared unto Pharaoh in the likeness of a captain of the guard. And the angel of Ahiah took the sword from the hand of the captain of the guard and took his head off with it. For the likeness of the captain of the guard was turned into the likeness of Moses. And the angel of Ahiah took hold of him, took hold of the right hand of Moses, and brought him from Egypt, and placed him from without the borders of Egypt, a distance of forty days' journey. And Aaron his brother alone remained in the land of Egypt. And he prophesied to the children of Israel, saying, Thus saith Ahiah Alahayim of your ancestors, Throw away each man the abominations of his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. And the children of Israel rebelled and would not hearken to Aaron at that time. And Ahiah thought to destroy them, were it not that Ahiah remembered the covenant which he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In those days the hand of Pharaoh continued to be severe against the children of Israel, and he crushed and oppressed them until the time when Elohim sent forth his word and took notice of them. Yeah, that's up there. Um, so it was amazing to see that we had started going over to the idolatry. Right. We got used to the lifestyle there starting getting destroyed. Joshua 72, verse 1, and then verse 21 to 23, and then verse 25 to 26, and then verse 29 to 42. Joshua chapter 72, verse 1. And it was in those days that there was a great war between the children of Cush and the children of the east and Amram. And they rebelled against the king of Cush, in whose hands they were. Verse 21. At that time that the war and the siege were against Cush, Moses fled from Egypt from Pharaoh, who had sought to kill him for having slain the Egyptian. And Moses was 18 years old when he fled from Egypt from the presence of Pharaoh. And he fled and escaped to the camp of Kikanis which at that time was besieged in Cush. And Moses was nine years in the camp of Kikanus, king of Cush, all the time that they were besieging Cush. And Moses went out and came in with them. You're going to probably get the backstory of that with Balaam. Remember, Balaam had fled to Cush, right? right. While Balaam was in Cush, he pulled a coup d'etat, as they would say, to usurp authority and take dominion of Cush. So the king of Cush went out to fight. He's fighting against the children of the east and the children of Aram. While Balaam is setting up the Cushites to usurp and not let the king back in. After Cush is finished with the fight with Aram and the children of the east, then when they go back to their kingdom, they realize Balaam has taken over the kingdom of Cush. When Kikanis came back, the king, when he came back, he thought that the doors were just shut. Mm -hmm. And he thought because they took so long to get back mm -hmm. that they had shut the doors of the city. And they tried to get in, and they found out that Balaam had pulled a coop. Mm -hmm. And then that's when Mushi came when they were camped outside of the city. And at the end of nine years, Kikanis was seized with a mortal disease, and his illness prevailed over him, and he died on the seventh day. So his servants embalmed him and carried him and buried him opposite the city gate to the north of the land of Egypt. Now, after the death of Kikanis, king of Cush, it grieved his men and troops greatly on account of the war. So they said one to another, Give us counsel what we are to do at this time, as we have resided in the wilderness nine years away from our homes. If we say we will fight against the city, many of us will fall wounded or killed. And if we remain here in the siege, we shall also die. For now all the kings of Aram and of the children of the east will hear that our king is dead and they will attack us. 
suddenly in a hostile manner, and they will fight against us and leave no remnant of us. Now therefore let us go and make a king over us, and let us remain in the siege until the city is delivered up to us. And they wish to choose on that day a man for king from the army of Kikanis, and they found no object of their choice like Moses to reign over them. And they hastened and stripped off each man his garments, cast them upon the ground, and they made a great heap and placed Moses thereon. And they rose up and blew with their trumpets and called out before him and said, May the king live, may the king live. And all the people and nobles swore unto him to give him for a wife, Adoniah the queen, the Cushite, wife of Kikanis. And they made Moses king over them on that day. Notice they gave Moses a Cushite wife. We're going to see that Moses never touched the woman. And all the people of Cush issued a proclamation on that day, saying, Every man must give something to Moses of what is in his possession. And they spread out a sheet upon the heap, and every man cast into it something of what they had, one a gold earring and the other a coin. Also of onyx stones and bedlam, pearls and marble did the children of Cush cast unto Moses upon the heap. Also silver and gold in great abundance. And Moses took all the silver and gold, all the vessels and the bedlam and the onyx stones which he had, which all the children of Cush had given him, and he placed them amongst his treasures. And Moses reigned over the children of Cush on that day in the place of Kikandis. All right. Now we jump into Joshua 73, verse 1 and 2, and verse 31 to 38. Joshua chapter 73, verse 1. In the 55th year of the reign of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that is in the 157th year of the Israelites going down to Egypt, reign Mushi and Cush. Moses was 27 years old when he began to reign over Cush, and 40 years did he reign. Verse 31. And they placed a royal crown upon his head, and they gave him for a wife, Adonai the Cushite queen, wife of Kikanis. And Mushi feared Ahiah Elohim of his fathers, so that he came not to her, nor did he turn his eyes to her. For Moses remembered how Abram had made his servant Eleazar swear, saying unto him, Thou shalt not take a woman from the daughter of Canaan, for my son Isaac. Also, what Isaac did when Jacob had fled from his brother when he commanded him, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife from the daughter of the Canaan, nor make alliance with any of the children of Ham. For Ahiah Laham gave Ham the son of Noah, and his children and all his seed as slaves to the children of Shem, and to the children of Japheth, and unto their seed after them for slaves forever. Therefore Mushi turned not his heart, nor his eyes, to the wife of Kikanis, all the days that he reigned over Cush. And Mushi feared Ahiah Elohim all his life, and Mushi walked before Ahiah in truth, and all his heart, with all his heart and his soul. And he turned not from the right way all the days of his life. He declined not from the way either to the right or to the left in which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had walked. So there we see the commandments. People who he was keeping the commandments before we received the fullness of the law and the rest of the law on Mount Sinai. All right? We have verse 38. Thank you. And Mushi strengthened himself in the kingdom of the children of Cush, and he guided the children of Cush with his usual wisdom, and Mushi prospered in his kingdom as king of Cush. All right, and now that gives understanding for Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, where it said that, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now you understand that. That Ethiopian woman was speaking of Adoniah, the Cushite queen. Right. Now, it was not talking about Zipporah. Zipporah is a Midianite. And unless you know, Moses never touched that woman. Now we have an understanding of what that was actually talking about. Let's continue with Joshua chapter 76, verse 1 to 13, and verse 21 to 23. Joshua 76 and 1. And Moses, the son of Amram, was still king in the land of Cush in those days, and he prospered in his kingdom. And he conducted the government of the children of Cush in justice, in righteousness, and integrity. All the children of Cush loved Mushi all the days that he reigned over them. 
and all the inhabitants of the land of Cush were greatly afraid of him. And in the fortieth year of the reign of Moses over Cush, Moses was sitting upon the royal throne while his Adoniah, the queen, was before him, and all the nobles were sitting around him. And Adoniah, the queen, said before the king and the princes, What is this thing which you, the children of Cush, have done for this long time? Surely you know that for forty years this man has reigned over Cush. He has not approached me, nor has he served the Elohim to the children of Cush. So we see the righteousness that he operated in. Even though in a position of power, he would not transgress the commandments. That's, right. That's the exhortation for us. Even with the position of power or low position, we do not transgress the commandments of Elohim. That's right. right. Continue. Now therefore hear, O ye children of Cush, and let this man no more reign over you as he is not of our flesh. Behold, Menacherus, my son, is grown up. Behold, Menacherus, my son, is grown up. Let him reign over you, for it is better for you to serve the son of your Dono than to serve a stranger, slave of the king of Egypt, if she was bitter. Yeah. And all the people and nobles of the children of Cush heard the words of Adonai the queen had spoken in their ears. And all the people were preparing until the evening, and in the morning they rose up early and made Menacherus, son of Kikanus, the king over them. And all the children of Cush were afraid to stretch forth their hand against Mushi, for Ahio was with Mushi. And the children of Cush remembered the oath which they swore to Mushi, therefore did no harm to him. But the children of Cush gave many presents to Mushi, and sent him from them with great honor. So Mushi went forth from the land of Cush and went home and ceased to reign over Cush. And Mushi was 66 years old when he went out of the land of Cush. For the thing was from Ahiah, for the period had arrived, which he had appointed in the days of old to bring forth Israel from the affliction mm. of the children of Ham. Mm. You see how everything happened at Ahiah's appointed time. Right. Right? Verse 13. So Mushi went to Midian, for he was afraid to return to Egypt on account of, the, of Pharaoh. And he went and sat at a well of the water in Midian. This is amazing how we get the backstory of everything to yeah. understand what transpired all that time with Moses. I we jump in Exodus chapter 2, verse 16 to 20. Exodus chapter 2, verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the throws of, to water their father's flock. And this is that Ruel, or also known as Jethro, that had got in trouble in Egypt for telling the truth, to tell Pharaoh, leave the Israelites alone, right? Continue. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Mushi stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? And why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. All right. Let me see. Let's jump to Joshua 77, verse 25 to 51, so we can get more of what happened in this story. Joshua chapter 77, verse 25. And Elohim saw the burden of the children of Israel and their heavy work in those days, and he determined to deliver them. And Mushi, the son of Amron, was still confined in the dungeon in those days, in the house of Ruel the Midianite. And therefore the daughter of Ruel did support him with food secretly day by day. So we see Ruel's daughter, she was working righteousness. She made sure that he was supported. <laughs> right, continue. And uh, Ruel threw him in the prison uh, because he had heard the, the story of what he did to the Ethiopians. He had thought that he had robbed and pillaged the Ethiopians mm -hmm. and then came to him. Mm -hmm. And he didn't believe Moses' story. Uh -huh. So he threw him in prison. Uh -huh. Cause Moses told him everything that happened, but right. he didn't believe he didn't it. Believe him. Uh -huh. And Moses was confined in the dungeon in the house of Royal for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, which was the first year of the reign of Pharaoh over Egypt in the place of his father, the poor said to her father, Ruel, No person inquires or seeks after the Hebrew man, whom thou didst bind in prison now ten years. Now, therefore, if it seem good in thy sight, let us send and see whether he is living or dead. But her father knew not that she had supported him. And Ruel, her father, answered and said to her, Has ever such a thing happened that a man should be shut up in a prison without food for ten years, and that he should live? 
With Al Hayim, all things are possible. <laughs> right. But it also showed the iniquity that Ruel was in to lock somebody in a prison for 10 years and, and, and hope for him to die. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. tough. Also, the testament of Ahaya's mercy upon the Gentiles, even. Right. For Ruel to have done that in Ahaya, and he still converted in the end. Right. And the, and the poor answered her father, saying, Surely thou hast heard that the Elohim of the Hebrews is great and awful. So she was learning over the Elohim of the Hebrews. So she was feeding him and she must have been talking with him as well. But she already knew from her father too because he knew. Right. You had mentioned that earlier. Yes. And does wonders for all for them at all times. He it is who delivered Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees and Isaac from the sword of his father and Jacob from the angel of Ahiah who wrestled with him at the fort of Jabuk. Also, with this man, she been talking to Mushi. She been talking to Mushi. <laughs> she yeah. been talking to Mushi. How yeah. she know those intricate she, details? Right. She knows. She been talking. To Mushi. <laughs> also, with this man, has he done many things? He delivered him from the river of Egypt and from the sword of Pharaoh and from the children of Cush. So also can he deliver him from famine and make him live? She knew who she was serving by taking care of him. Right, I am of heaven. And the thing seemed good in the sight of Ruel, and he did according to the word of his daughter, and sent to the dungeon to ascertain what became of, of Mushi. And he saw, and behold, the man Mushi was living in the dungeon, standing upon his feet, praising and praying to the Elohim of his ancestors. Hey, enduring afflictions. That's right. With praise of the Elohim. Ten years in the prison. Praise in the nonetheless. All right. And Ruel commanded Mushi to be brought out of the dungeon. So they shaved him and changed his prison garments, and he ate bread. And afterward, Mushi went into the garden of Ruel, which was behind the house, and there prayed to Ahiah, his Elohim, who had done mighty wonders for him. And it was that while as he prayed, he looked opposite to him. And behold, a sapphire stick was placed in the ground, which was planted in the midst of the garden. I got to touch on something before we keep going. Uh, Ahai is wonderful with what he was doing for Mushi because he was preparing his heart. He made him take 10 years and brought him very, very low so that he could appreciate the great works of Elohim and to learn obedience. Because if you're sitting in the dungeon for 10 years, you really get a chance to, to get your mind and your thoughts together. So don't take it the wrong way when Elohim brings you to a lower state because he's just humbling you so that you may obey his voice. So it was great with what Ahaya did for Mushi, preparing him for what was to come right after. That is a great exhortation for all of us because there are some of us who have literally been separated. Right. And we need to understand that, that this time Ahaya has given us is to prepare our hearts it's not to look at it as if we're being afflicted, but to rejoice in it, knowing that we're being prepared for something greater. Right. And afterward, Mushi went into the garden of Ruel, which was behind the house, and there prayed to Ahiah his Elohim, which had done mighty wonders for him. And it was that while as he prayed, he looked opposite to him, and behold, a sapphire stick was placed in the ground, which was planted in the midst of the garden. And he approached the stick, and he looked, and behold, the name of Ahaya Elohim on Sobawata was engraved thereon, written and developed upon the stick. And he read it and stretched forth his hand, and he plucked it like a forest tree from the thicket, and the stick was in his hand. And this is the stick with which all the works of our Elohim were performed after he had created heaven and earth, and all the host of them, seas, rivers, and all their fishes. And when Elohim had driven Adam from the garden of Eden, he took the stick in his hand and went and tilled the ground from which he was taken. And the stick came down to Noah and was given to Shem and his descendants until they came into the hand of Abram, the Hebrew. And Abraham had given all he had to his son Isaac. He also gave to him the stick. And when Yaakov had fled to Padan Aram. He took it into his hand, and when he returned to his father, he had not left it behind him. So 
That was the one staff that Yaakov had. Right. He came over with. And when he went down to Egypt, he took it in his hand and gave it to Joseph, one portion above his brethren. So that was the one portion. Mm -hmm. And Jacob had taken it by force from his brother Esau. And after the death of Yosef, the nobles of Egypt came into the house of Joseph, and the stick came into the hand of Ruel the Midianite. And when he went out of Egypt, he took it in his hand and planted it in his garden. So we see after Joseph died, they plundered his house. Right. All right. And all the mighty men of the Kenites tried to pluck it. And when they endeavored to get before his daughter, but they were unsuccessful. So that stick remained planted in the garden of Ruel until he came who had right to it and took it. And when Ruel saw the stick in the hand of Moses, he wondered at it. And it gave him his daughter Zephora for a wife. That's an interesting backstory to know how Mushi ended up having Zephora as his wife. Right. And also the stick that he did all the mighty wonders with. The rod of Elohim. Right. Exodus chapter 2 verse 21. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. He gave Moses the four, his daughter. Now you know the whole story behind how Moshe got Zipporah. All right. All right. I'll jump in with you here. It's Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Now Moshe kept the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. And the angel of Ahayah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when Ahiah saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the Alahim of thy father, the Alahim of Abraham, the Alahim of Ichikakwa, and the Alahim of Yaakobe. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Alahim. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 15. And Ahiah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land of Egypt unto a good land and a large and a land flowing with milk and honey into the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression with the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto Elohim, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve Elohim upon this mountain. And this is we're leading up to the Feast of First Fruits, where they, they, they served Elohim upon the mountain. Exodus chapter 3 verse 13. And Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And Elohim said unto Moses, Ahaya, Ashere, Ahaya. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ahaya has sent me unto you. And Elohim said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ahaya, Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Ichikakwa, and the Elohim of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. You want to stop there or you want to finish this? I'm going to finish it. Right. Nice Shabbat lesson. All right. Now I'm going to read Exodus chapter 5, and then you want to jump back in at Asher? Yeah. All right. And after Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith Ahiah, Elohim Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is Ahiah, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not Ahiah, neither would I let Israel go. And they said, The Elohim of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto Ahiah, our Elohim, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? 
Get you unto your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks which they did make for heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our Allah. I am. Let therefore more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. And the taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where you can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters hastened them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants, and they say to us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle, therefore say ye, Let us go and do sacrifice to Ahaya. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall ye deliver the tale of the bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case after it was said, Ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. Mm. And they met Mushi and Aharon, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, Ahaya, look upon you, and judge, because ye have made our savor to be a board in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hands to slay us. And Mushi returned unto Ahaya and said, Adonai, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. So he sees the trial of our faith to see if we're going to believe. Because things got worse when I had said he was going to deliver us to see if we'd believe his word or trust in what we see. Right? The woman travail. Joshua chapter 79, verse 43. And when the king saw this thing, he ordered the book of records that related to the kings of Egypt to be brought. And they brought the book of records, the chronicles of the kings of Egypt. Now, this is touching back to when he had said, who is Ahaya? I'm not going to let them go. This is the backstory of what was being discussed when he said, who is Ahaya? In which all the idols of Egypt were inscribed, for they thought of finding therein the name of Ahaya. But they found it not. And Pharaoh said unto Mushi and Eruano, Behold, I have not found the name of your Elohim written in this book, and his name I know not. And that's why he said in Exodus chapter 5, Who is Ahaya? I know not Ahaya. And the counselors and wise men answered the king, We have heard that the Elohim of the Hebrews is the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. And Pharaoh turned to Mushi and Eruano and said to them, I know not. Ahaya, whom you have declared, neither will I send his people. So their false witness is a stumbling block to Pharaoh, right? And they answered and said to the king, Ahaya, Elohim of Elohims is his name. And he proclaimed his name over us from the days of our ancestors mm. and sent us, saying, Go to Pharaoh and say unto him, Send my people that they may serve me. Now therefore send us that we may take a journey of three days into the wilderness and they may sacrifice to him. For from the days of our going down to Egypt, he hath not taken from our hands either burnt offering, oblation, or sacrifice. And if thou wilt not send us, his anger will be kindled against thee, and he will smite Egypt either with plague or with the sword. And Pharaoh said to them, Tell me now his power and his might. And they said to him, He created the heaven and the earth, the seas and all the fishes. He formed the light created the darkness, caused rain upon the earth and watered it. He made the herbage and grass to sprout. He created man and beast and, and the animals of the forest, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and by his mouth they live and die. Mm -hmm. 
Surely he created thee in thy mother's womb, and put into thee the breath of life, and reared thee and placed thee upon the royal throne of Egypt, and he would take thy breath and soul from thee, and return thee to the ground whence thou was taken. And the anger of the king was kindled at their words, and he said to them, But who amongst all the Elohims of nations can do this? And this is the devil in his heart. My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. He really thought he actually did something. And it's an exhortation for us to be mindful, to think that we actually control or do anything. Because right. he even said Elohim was who reared him and raised him up. So we have to be mindful. You know, people try to say, uh, take care of yourself. Right. You have to be mindful. Do not agree with such comments. Because that's, right. that's, that's making yourself your own Elohim. That's why we don't celebrate birthdays and things of that nature. We do nothing to offend the Elohim of heaven and earth. Right. And he drove them from him. And he ordered the labor upon Israel to be more severe than it was yesterday and before. All right. You see, as it was talking about in Exodus chapter 5. And Moshe and Aaron went out from the king's presence. And they saw the children of Israel in an evil condition, for the taskmasters had made their labor exceedingly heavy. And Moses returned to Ahiah and said, Why hast thou ill-treated thy people? For since I came to speak to Pharaoh, what thou didst send me for, he has exceedingly ill-used the children of Israel. Notice that's the same thing he said in Exodus 5 and 23. So you see this the same story. Continue. And Ahiah said to Moshe, Behold, thou wilt see that with an outstretched hand and heavy plagues, Pharaoh will send the children of Israel from his land. All right. And this touching right what he said in Exodus chapter 6, verse 1 to 13. I guess I'll read that one. Then Ahiah said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And Ahiah spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am Ahiah. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Ichikakwa, and to Yaakobe by the name of Allah Shodaiyeh. But by my name Ahiah was I not known to them. And then you can see why the Egyptians didn't have his name in their records as well. Right. It wasn't revealed that his name was Ahiah, Ashere Ahiah, until it was revealed to Moses on the mount. Right. Uh, verse 4. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians have kept in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Ahiah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a Allahayim, and ye shall know that I am Ahiah, your Allahayim which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land concerning which I did swear to give it up to Abraham, to Ichikakwa, and to Yaakobe, and I will give it you for an heritage. I am Ahaya. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Jasher chapter 79, verse 56 and 7, Moses and Aaron were living among their brethren, as it says, Jasher 79, 56 and 57, and Moses and Aaron dwelt amongst their brethren, the children of Israel, in Egypt, and as for the children of Israel, the Egyptians had bitter their lives with heavy work, which they imposed upon them. Two years after this is when it's time. Now the judgments are coming. When Ahiah sends them now, it's what it took about. It was like 20 days. Everything. When the judgment started, the plague started coming. It was back to back to back. All right. It was. Uh, Joshua chapter 80, verse 1. All right. And at the end of two years, Ahiah again sent Moshe to Pharaoh to bring forth the children of Israel and to send them out of the land of Egypt. And Moses went and came to the house of Pharaoh and he spoke to him the words of Ahiah who had sent him. But Pharaoh would not hearken to the voice of Ahiah. And Elohim roused his might in Egypt upon Pharaoh and his subjects. And Elohim smote Pharaoh and his people with very great and sore plagues. And Ahiah spake unto Moses, saying, Go ye, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before Ahiah, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? And Ahiah spake unto Moses and Aharonah, 
and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh the king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They were given that charge. So you see how the deliverance was set. I had said he was going to do what he was going to do. We were facing much tribulation. Everything looked bad. And we were being tried to see if we would obey his voice and believe. Right. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. And the highest said to Mushi, See, I have made thee an Alhayim to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of that land of Egypt by great judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Ahia. When I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them, and Moshe and Aaron did as Ahiah commanded them, so did they. All right, so these are the two witnesses that were sent. When you look at Psalms 105, verse 23 to 27. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob is adjourned in the land of Ham. And he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. And he turned their heart to hate his people and to deal subtly with his servants. And we read about all the things that they had done. Continue. Right. He sent Moshe, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They show his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. And these things are going to come again in the end. Now let's jump to Jubilees chapter 48, verse 1 to 11. And this, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. This is the angel of the presence talking to Moshe about what had transpired. Okay. And in the sixth year of the third week of the 49th Jubilee, thou didst depart and dwell five weeks in one year. And thou didst return into Egypt in the second week, in the second year, in the fiftieth jubilee. And thou thyself knowest what he spake unto thee on Mount Sinai, and what Prince Mastema desired to do with thee when thou wast returning into Egypt. And that was when Satan tried to kill Mushi and his son for not circumcising him. Did he not with all his power seek to slay thee and deliver the Egyptians out of thy hand? when he saw that thou was sent to execute judgment and vengeance on the Egyptians? So there we see that Satan was ruling over the Egyptians, right. and he was seeking an occasion against Mushi to kill him so that Mushi could not fulfill the prophecy that Ahia had set to deliver the children of Israel by the hand of Mushi and Aaron, his witnesses. And I delivered thee out of his hand, and thou didst perform the signs and wonders which which thou was sent to perform in Egypt against Pharaoh. And there we see that it was the angel of the presence, Yache, that delivered Mushi out of his hands. So we see that through the two witnesses, it was Yache doing the mighty works. That's right. Continue. And against all his house, and against his servants and his people. And Ahia executed a great vengeance on them for, it, for Israel's sake, and smote them through the plagues of blood and frogs, lice and dog flies, malignant boils, breaking forth in blands, and their cattle by death and by hailstones, thereby he destroyed everything that grew for them, and by locusts which devoured the residue which had been left by the hail, and by darkness, and of the firstborn of men and animals, and on all their idols, Ahia took vengeance and burned them with fire. And everything was sent through thy hand, that thou shouldest declare these things before they were done. And thou didst speak with the king of Egypt before all his servants and before his people. And everything took place according to thy words. Ten great and terrible judgments came on the land of Egypt, right. that thou mightest execute vengeance on it for Israel. And Ahiah did everything for Israel's sake. And according to his covenant, which he had ordained with Abraham, that he would take vengeance on them, excuse me, as they had been brought, as they and they had brought them by force into bondage. And that was told to Abraham in Genesis 15, about verse 13. For 400 years they shall be they shall sojourn in a land that's not theirs, and the people shall afflict them, and at the end of 400 years he shall judge them. Right. That came to pass through Mushi, the two witnesses. At the end of the 400 years, two witnesses came, and the judgments came, 
and the people were delivered. The same thing is coming here at the end of the world as we're getting towards the end. It's going to be just like the Exodus. The two witnesses are going to be sent to testify of the truth of Allah Hayyam. The true gospel is going to be preached. Then the end shall come. And the judgments are going to come upon Egypt again. And the judgments are going to come upon Babylon. And the prince master must stood up against thee and sought to cast thee into the hands of Pharaoh, and he helped the Egyptian sorcerers. And this was key to understand what was working behind the Egyptians. Right. It was Satan. Right? Continue. And they stood up and wrought before thee the evils indeed were we permitted them to work. And notice who truly has control <laughs> right. of everything? He said what we permitted them to work. That's right. So understand that don't fear the devil, he has no power. That's right. This is what he was permitted to work. So that's why we have to endure trust in Allah. I am knowing that he is faithful. But the remedies we did not allow to be wrought in their hands. Mm. So he let them do the words that didn't let them get healed. And Ahia smote them with malignant ulcers. And they were not able to stand. For we destroyed them so that they could not perform a single sign. So we see the things that were seen in the flesh. There was There's a spiritual war going on in right. the spirit. And the angel of Ahaya destroyed their works. Ahaya stopped all their stuff and didn't let them get a remedy. That's why they were saying, That's why they said this is the finger of Allah. Because right. they couldn't do their <laughs> machinations anymore. All right. Let's jump into Joshua chapter 80 verse 2 to 42, we on the home stretch here, just about brothers and sisters. Joshua chapter 80, verse 2. Mm -hmm. And Mushi went and came to the house of Pharaoh, and he spoke to him the words of Ahiah, who had sent him. But Pharaoh would not hearken to the voice of Ahiah, and Elohim roused his might in Egypt upon Pharaoh and his subjects. And Elohim smote Pharaoh and his people with very great and sore plagues. And Ahiah sent by the hand of Edorano, and turned all the waters of Egypt into the blood, and all their streams and rivers. And when an Egyptian came to drink and draw water, he took into his pitcher, and behold, all the water was turned into blood. And when he came to drink from his cup, the water in the cup became blood. And when a woman kneaded her dough and cooked her victuals, their appearance was turned into that of blood. And the hyacinth again and caused all their waters to bring forth frogs. And all the frogs came into the house of the Egyptians. And when the Egyptians drank, their bellies were filled with frogs, mm. and they danced in their bellies as they danced when in the river. And all their drinking water and cooking water turned to frogs. Also, when they laid their beds, their perspiration bred frogs. Mm. Notwithstanding, all this, the anger of Ahia did not turn from them. So here you're getting more of the story of what was going on. This right. is gruesome stuff. And his hand was stretched out against all the Egyptians to smite them with every heavy plague. And he sent and smote their dust to lice. And the lice became in Egypt to the height of two cupids upon the earth. And the lice were also very numerous in the flesh of man and beast and in all the inhabitants of Egypt. Also upon the king and queen of Ahia sent the lice. And it grieved Egypt exceedingly on account of the lice. Notwithstanding this, the anger of Ahia did not turn away, and his hand was still stretched out over Egypt. And Ahia sent all kinds of beasts of the field into Egypt, and they came and destroyed all the Egypt, man and beast, and trees, and all things that were in Egypt. And Ahia sent fiery serpents, scorpions, mice, weasels, toads, together with all creeping and dust, flies, hornets, fleas, bugs, and gnats, each swarm according to its kind. And all reptiles and winged animals, according to their kind, came to Egypt and grieved the Egyptians exceedingly. And the fleas and flies came into the eyes and ears of the Egyptians. See, this is like a scary movie. Right. Right. And all the hornets came upon them and drove them away. And they removed from it into their inner rooms and it pursued them. And when the Egyptians hid themselves on account of the swarm of animals, they locked their doors after them. And Elohim ordered Shalanut. Mm -hmm. which, this is the giant octopus from the ocean, right? Which was in the sea to come up and go into Egypt. Because everybody locked their doors because they're trying to get away from the plague, right? right? Continue. And she had long arms, ten cupids in length of the cupid of a man. And she went upon the roofs and uncovered the raffings and flooring and cut them and stretched forth her hand into the house and removed the lock and the bolt and opened the houses of Egypt. Afterward came the swarm of animals into the houses of Egypt, and the swarm of animals destroyed the Egyptians, and it grieved them exceedingly. 
Notwithstanding this, the anger of Ahiah did not turn away from the Egyptians, and his hand was yet stretched forth against them. And Elohim sent the pestilence, and the pestilence pervaded Egypt. And the horses and asses and the camels, and the herds of oxen and sheep and in man. And when the Egyptians rose up early in the morning to take their cattle to pasture, they found all their cattle dead. And there remained of the cattle of the Egyptians only one in ten, and of the cattle belonging to Itzriala and Goshen, not one died. And Elohim sent a burning inflammation in the flesh of the Egyptians, which burst their skins, and it became a severe itch in all the Egyptians from the sole of their feet to the crown of their heads. And many boils were in their flesh, that their flesh wasted away until they became rotten and poultried. Notwithstanding, this the anger of Ahiah did not turn away, and his hand was still stretched out over all Egypt, and Ahiah sent a very heavy hail, which smote their vines and broke their fruit trees and dried them up, and they fell upon them. Also, every green herb became dry and perished, for a mingling fire descended amidst the hail. Therefore the hail and the fire consumed all things. Also men and beasts that were found abroad perished of the flames of fire and of hail, and all the young lions were exhausted. And Ahiah sent and brought numerous locusts into Egypt, the Chazel, the Shalom, Kogel, locusts each of its kind, which devoured all that the hail had left remaining. Then the Egyptians rejoiced at the locusts, although they consumed the produce of the field, and they caught them in abundance and salted them for food. And Ahiah turned a mighty wind of the sea, which took away all the locusts, even those that were salted, and thrust them into the Red Sea. Not one locust remained within the boundaries of Egypt. Ahiah didn't suffer it. Continue. Right. And Elohim sent darkness upon Egypt, that the whole land of Egypt and Pathos became dark for three days, so that a man could not see his hand when he lifted it to his mouth. These three days are the 11th, 12th, and 13th of the first Hebrew month. Continue. At that time died many of the people of Israel who had rebelled against Ahiah, and who would not hearken to Moshe and Aaron, and believed not in them that Elohim had sent them, and who had said, We will not go forth from Egypt, lest we perish with hunger in a desolate wilderness, and who would not hearken to the voice of Moshe. And Ahiah plagued them in the three days of darkness, and the Israelites buried them in those days without the Egyptians knowing of them or rejoicing over them. And the darkness was very great in Egypt for three days, and any person who was standing when the darkness came remained standing in his place. And he that was sitting remained sitting, and he that was lying continued lying in the same state. And he that was walking remained sitting upon the ground in the same spot. And this thing happened to all the Egyptians until the darkness had passed away. And the days of darkness passed away, and Ahiah sent Musha and Adorano to the children of Israel, saying, Celebrate your feast and make your Passover. For behold, I come in the midst of the night among all the Egyptians, and I will smite all their firstborn, from the firstborn of a man to the firstborn of beast. This is on Shabbat that day. All right, continue. And when I see your Passover, I will pass over you. And the children of Israel did according to all that Ahiah had had commanded Moshe and Aaron. Thus did they that night. We see they kept the feast that night. And at midnight, we know from the story that the uh, angel came and destroyed. Now let's jump down, scroll down some to uh, finish the story out at Jubilees chapter 48, verse 12 to 19. Okay. And notwithstanding, all these signs and wonders, the prince Mastermo was not put to shame because he took courage and cried to the Egyptians to pursue after thee with all the powers of the Egyptians, with their chariots and with their horses, and with all the host of the people of Egypt. Verse 13. And I stood between the Egyptians and Israel, and we delivered Israel out of his hand, and out of the hand of his people. And Ahiah brought them through the midst of the sea, as it were, dry land. And notice the angel said, and I stood between the midst of the people and the Egyptians, because that's the angel, that's Yahweh speaking, because he was the angel in the cloudy pillar that was guiding Israel there. And all the peoples whom he brought to pursue after Israel, Ahiah, Elohim, cast them into the midst of the sea, into the depths of the abyss beneath the children of Israel, 
Even the people of Egypt had cast their children into the river. He took vengeance on one million of them. So even as they had done to us by casting our children in the river, I had recompensed it upon their head. And 1,000 strong and energetic men were destroyed on account of one suckling of the children of thy people, which they had thrown into the river. And on the 14th day, and on the 15th, and on the 16th, on the 17th and the 18th, Prince Mastema was bound and imprisoned behind the children of Israel that he might not accuse them. So now we see what was going on in the spiritual, why Passover was on the 14th day. Why Satan was bound so that we could get out. He could not accuse us so that we could be delivered. So you can understand what is going on in the spiritual world to know for a surety that they are always spirits working. And on the 19th, we let them loose, that they might help the Egyptians and pursue the children of Israel. And he hardened their hearts and made them stubborn. And the device was devised by Ahayalahayim, that he might smite the Egyptians and cast them into the sea. And on the 14th, we bound him, that he may not accuse the children of Israel on the day when he asked the Egyptians for vessels and garments. So the day when they asked the Egyptians for vessels and garments, when they took all that stuff that night on the 15th, Satan was bound. Right. So he couldn't hinder them. Continue. Vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of bronze in order to despoil the Egyptians in return for the bondage in which they had forced them to serve. Mm -hmm. And we did not lead forth the children of Israel from Egypt empty-handed. And there we see that it was the angels, right. the angel of Ahaya, working and delivering us from the hands of Satan. And all that to see that, yes, that we have the physical story of Egypt, what happened in Exodus, right. and to understand what was going on Spiritual. in the spirit. It right. was the devil. And it, can't, it was the devil trying to withstand the, the will of Allah. And as we see, the devil really had no power because he only was allowed to do what Yahweh allowed him to do. Right. So this gives us confidence to trust in Ahaya, know that he shall deliver us just like he delivered us before. And also for the Gentiles to know that Ahaya shall deliver all who call upon him and trust in him by keeping the commandments and bearing the fruits of the Spirit. Because there was a mixed multitude that went out of Egypt, so the Gentiles left with us too. So if you believe in Yahweh by faith, and bear the fruits of his spirit and keep the commandments given by Ahaya Alahayam, indeed, you shall come out of this great tribulation to come as well to partake in the kingdom of Yahche. Right. And don't operate in your own wisdom because we've seen with our forefathers when they were sitting there before the water and the armies of Egypt were coming upon them that they started going into their own understanding of how to operate or how to deal with the situation. But we are not to go into our own wisdom in anything, but always cleaving into the wisdom and understanding of Ahaya and praying unto him and praying unto Yahweh and taking heed under your covering of your husband to, to get understanding or to get further instruction or guidance as to what you should do. So just saying that on any aspect and anything that you do. A great exhortation. Did you want to read it out, the text? Or? Go ahead. All right. It was Jasher chapter 81, verse 25. This is after Satan had got loose. So in Jasher 81, 25, And the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and beheld all the Egyptians pursuing them. And the children of Israel were greatly terrified at them. And the children of Israel cried to Ahaya. And on account of the Egyptians, the children of Israel divided themselves into four divisions. And they were divided in their four opinions. For they were afraid of the Egyptians, and Moses spake to each of them. The first division was of the children of Reuben, Simeon, and Issachar, and they resolved to cast themselves into the sea, for they were exceedingly afraid of the Egyptians. And Moses said to them, Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of Ahiah, which he will effect this day for you. The second division was the children of Zebulon, Benjamin, and Naphtali. They resolved to go back to Egypt with the Egyptians. And Moses said to them, Fear not, for as you have seen the Egyptians this day, so shall ye see them no more forever. The third division was of the children of Judah and Joseph, and they resolved to go to meet the Egyptians to fight with them. And Moses said to them, Stand in your places, for Ahiah will fight for you, and you shall remain silent. 
And the fourth division was of the children of Levi, Gad, and Asher. And they resolved to go into the midst of the Egyptians and to confound them. And Moses said to them, Remain in your stations and fear not. Only call unto Ahiah, that he may save you out of their hands. And after Moses arose from amidst the people, and he prayed to Ahiah and said, O Ahiah, Alahim of the whole earth, save now thy people whom thou didst bring forth from Egypt, and let not the Egyptians boast that power and might are theirs. So Ahiah said to Moses, Why dost thou cry unto me? Speak to the children of Israel that they shall proceed, and do thou stretch thy rod upon the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall pass through it. So we see how they're going to be delivered. Just got to trust and believe. And we'll pass through the water. So this is only a short time. I already knows exactly what we need and what situations we're going to be in. We just have to trust in him. And you see that Mushi inquired while the rest of everybody was trusting in their own strength, for their own wisdom, or their own thoughts. But we're all supposed to be as Mushi. That's why he said we're supposed to be a holy priesthood. We're all supposed to be inquiring and seeking guidance. So don't operate according to your own understanding. But know that there's the Elohim that strives and fighteth for us in all things. So. Love you, man. Love you too, brother. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hope you enjoy your Shabbatah. <laughs> Shalom. Shalom. <laughs>